All righty. Chapter 23. Look at our review sheet problems here. Um, the first one, an electric motor is made using a permanent magnet with a magnetic field strength of 0.0533 teslas and a circular loop with a radius of 2.54 centimeters and 275 loops. That should look familiar because those are the same numbers we have from the problem in chapter 22. Now the question asks, what is the back EMF generated by this motor when it is rotating at 500 revolutions per minute? So we have our frequency is 500 revolutions per minute. Now one thing I'm going to do here is add an additional page or two. I'll put a couple in just to make sure we've got enough. And I'm going to have to move back and forth between pages as I work. So we have this frequency. Now back EMF, just the induced EMF according to e equals minus change in magnetic flux over change in time. So what we have here is because we have current um, <clears throat> going through this electric motor, it is going to be um, turning. But because it's turning, it's changing flux. And so if we look at the flux equation, magnetic flux is equal to magnetic field dotted to area. So in this case, our magnetic field is constant and our area is constant. It's a circle, so it's just going to be pi r squared. But then we have the dot product, which is measuring the parallel parts. So we're going to have times cosine of omega t, where omega is the angular frequency. Now, if I want to find this EMF, but the magnetic field isn't changing, it's constant. And pi isn't changing, it's constant. And radius isn't changing, it's constant. Time is changing with time. So what this becomes is equals minus nb pi r squared change in cosine of omega t over change in time. Now this is really a derivative and it really requires you to use calculus. But when you do calculus, this gives you minus nb pi r squared omega sine of omega t. Um, actually, there's another minus sign, so it's plus. This here, of course, was area, so it's nba omega sine of omega t. Where omega is the angular frequency, we had the frequency before, omega is just 2 pi f. So now I can answer one point A, kind of. I have the EMF is equal to NB times pi r squared times 2 pi f times sine of 2 pi ft. Well, I can put in most of these numbers. So the N here is 275. Magnetic field 0 0.0533 Teslas. Notice I have pi twice, so I'm just going to put pi squared here. The radius was 0 0.0254 meters squared. Um, got a 2 there. And the frequency, which was, well, it was 500 RPMs. RPM isn't the standard unit. Hertz is. So I need to convert this. That's revolutions per minute. I want revolutions per second. So I have one minute per 60 seconds. So that gives me a frequency of 8.33 repeating Hertz. So that's what I'm putting here. And then sine. And I'm just going to put 2 pi ft here. I'm not going to write out numbers. 
So if we calculate this, the number out front multiplies out to 1.556, or since we only have three, um, two sig figs, 1.6. Is it really only two sig figs? No, it's 254. I dropped a digit. 1.5. Five six volts times the sine of two pi f t. Now here's why I said I can almost answer it. The peak back EMF is equal to one point five six volts. If I wanted the RMS, the RMS is going to be that divided by square root of two. One point five six volts divided by the square root of two which is equal to 1.10 volts RMS. So I'm going to put in the peak here for my answer, but keep in mind the question was poorly um, phrased in that it could have been asking for the RMS could have been the average. The average is going to be zero because the average of sine, if you go through a complete cycle, is zero. So 1.56 is what I put in there. Now question two is really long. This is a lot of what we did in lab, but each calculation itself is short, thankfully. So a series RLC circuit is created using a 12.5 Henry inductor. So I have an inductor. L, I'm not going to write 12.5, a 350 nanofarad capacitor, so there's my C, R, so it's L, C, R, and it has a 10 volt power supply there. And it asks us, what's the impedance through each element? Well, for a resistor, the impedance is the resistance. So for the resistance, that's just going to be 480 ohms. That was quick. For a capacitor, remember, impedance is measuring um, how much it responds to current, whether it's taking away energy in a resistor or whether it is storing energy that gives back in a reactor. So Capacitors and inductors are reactors, and for a capacitor, the reactance is 1 over omega C. Well, because I'm going to use omega a bunch of times, my frequency was equal to 1050 hertz, so omega is equal to 2 pi F. So I'm going to take 1050 hertz and multiply it by 2 pi, and I get omega is equal to... 6597 radians per second. So to find the reactance of the capacitor, I'm going to take 1 divided by 6597 radians per second, and then staying in the denominator times my capacitance of 350 nanofarads. And so if I do that calculation, Seven rads per second, 350 times 10 minus 9 farads, and that gives me 433.1 ohms. I you know, only have three significant digits, but I went ahead and put that extra digit there. And then we have what about the, the impedance or the reactance of the inductor? Well, in that case, it's just omega L. And so and that was 12.5 Henry's. So that gives me a pretty big number here of 82,467. 
ohms again. 82,467. So roughly 82,000 more than the resistance or capacitance, or to put it another way, roughly 200 times more. So this is a very highly inductive circuit. This is like you might have if you have a, an electric fan, where you have a large inductance, not so much resistance or capacitance. Now it asks, what's the total impedance of this circuit? So remember the phasor diagrams. We had... The resistive went to the right. Actually, let me put this in the same order that we did in our final diagram. The inductive load, which I have in this kind of magenta color, goes up. There's XL. The resistive load goes horizontally. And then the capacitive load, which I have to change color on that one to avoid confusion goes like this. Now, these arrows are nowhere close to scale. But that's going to give us the total impedance is something like this. So there's Z. And here's our phase angle phi. So I find that by saying, well, this side here is R. This side here is XL minus XC. And so using the Pythagorean theorem, Z must be equal to the square root of R squared plus XL minus XC quantity squared. So I just put in my values. So my R was 480 ohms. My XL was 82467 ohms minus 433.1 ohms. And I get Z is equal to 82,035 ohms. So 82,035. Mine, that's a comma, not a decimal. So notice the total impedance is less than the inductive impedance. How is that possible? Because the capacitive impedance was working against that. Now the apparent power. To find the apparent power, I just have power apparent is equal to VI. Well, what is I? I is going to be equal to V over Z. Remember Ohm's law, I equals V over R. Well, in this case, it's impedance instead of resistance, but it's still the same rule. So I could come and I could put this in here and I could say power is equal to V squared over Z. But I'm going to actually calculate what the current is. So my voltage was 10 volts and my Z was 82,035 ohms. So that gives me a current of 0 0.1219 milliamperes. So that's a small current. Good, good. Not a lot of power if it's a small current. Then calculating the power, I'm just going to have 10 volts times 0 0.1219 milliamperes will give me 1.219 milli, and then the units. This is something we didn't talk about in class. The apparent power, we don't call it watts generally. It's still the, the unit is still a kilogram um, meter squared per second cubed, which is the unit of a watt. But we call it here voltage times amps. So that's my apparent power, 1.219 milli VAs. So milli VAs. And here I have the note VA is a volt amp is unit for apparent power with both resistive and reactive loads combined. What's the power used by the resistor? Well, the reason I did the current was so I could say power resistor 
is equal to I R or I I R. That was genius. Um, it's I squared, right? I is equal to well, we already have it. V is equal to I R, so I squared R. So that's going to be 0.1219 milliamps squared times my resistance of 480 ohms. And that gives me an actual power of 0 0.00713 milliwatts. Now notice that is way less. Uh oh, yeah, no, but 0. 00713 less than the apparent power. Um, apparent power used by the capacitor. Now this is going to be purely reactive, so we have VAR, volt amps reactive. And so for the power of the capacitor, I'm going to go ahead and calculate just like I did. 2G power capacitor is equal to I squared X sub C equal to 0 0.1219 million amperes squared times my X sub C was 433.1 ohms. And so the capacitor has a power here. Whoops. How did I get so off? A, B, C, D. Yeah. I, I am way off somehow on my my numbering power for capacitor is e no i guess i'm not i'm i was wrong on my answer yeah okay let, let's not I'm not worry about that too much um so the power for the capacitor is um, 0 0.006435 Six four, so we'll put six four four millivolt amps resistive, and the power for the inductor. Just doing this while I'm at it. Power for the inductor is equal to I squared X L is equal to zero point one two one nine milliamp squared times eight two four six seven ohms, and that is equal to 1.2254. Now here you notice, wow, the power for the inductor is bigger than the overall power. And the power there for the capacitor was 0 0.6430. Is six four four nodes. Okay, so there I have the powers for all these things. Now it says, what's the actual power? We don't need to do another calculation for the actual power. All I have to do, um, I I am so sorry. I will be back in just a second. I'm just texting my wife, telling her how long. Bad timing there. All right. So the actual power is only the power used by the resistor. Inductors don't use power. They store energy and give it back. Capacitors don't use power. They store energy and give it back. So I don't have to do a calculation. I just have the power used by the resistor is the actual power. And then for that phase angle, let's go back to our picture. Once again, just looking at this, I can quickly deduce that tangent of phi is equal to XL minus XC over R. And so um, phi is equal to arc tangent of XL, which was 82467 ohms minus XC, which was 433.1 ohms over R, which was 480 ohms, and that gives us virtually 9 degrees. It's 89.7 89 degrees. So 
So that's a very inductive load. Now we go through basically the whole problem with the resonant frequency. So how do I find the resonant frequency? Well, the resonant frequency is, as we did in lab, which, you know, which part is this? Resonant frequency is 2.i. When xl equals xc, you're at resonance. So that means that omega l is equal to 1 over omega c. Solve that for omega. That means I'm going to just divide both sides by l. And multiply both sides by omega. And so omega times omega is omega squared. The L's cancel. We have the omegas cancel. And I have omega squared is equal to 1 over LC. So omega is equal to 1 over the square root of LC. So 1 over the square root of 12.5 Henry's. Wow, what's that? Times 350 nanofarads. And we end up with our angular resonant frequency is 700 or 478 radians per second. Um, I think I asked for that in hertz. So to get the frequency from that, I just take my 478 radians per second and divide it by 2 pi radians per cycle. And that's going to give me a frequency of 76.09 hertz. So my resonant frequency is 76.09 hertz. And now I calculate my resistive impedance, which is once again just resistance. I could have put R there. I just put Z sub R to make you think about what does it mean to be the resistive impedance. So that's, again, 480 ohms. No work there. XC, to calculate XC, remember, once again, that is XC is equal to 1 over omega C. So that's going to be 1 divided by, and our omega here was um, 478. C was 350 times 10 to the minus 9 pairs. And so XC turns out to be 5,976 ohms. Now, if I want XL, to calculate XL, that's just omega L. So that's going to be 478 rads per second times 12.5 henrys, and that's equal to the same 5976. That was a horrible choice of color. I'm sorry. What's the total impedance of this circuit at the resonant frequency? Well, notice we have XC, that's the downward part, 5976. XL, the upward part, 5,976. If we make the phasor diagram, we're going to go up, over, and down, and end up straight across. And so, let me color coordinate somewhat. And so the resultant of that phasor diagram it's just going to be R. And so the total impedance is 480 ohms. The apparent power, well, I'm going to go and calculate the current again. That's where I got off. The current wasn't asked for, and I calculated it and called it in one of my calculations. So the current for part B, the current at resonance, is going to be equal to voltage over Z again. And so that's 10 volts over now my Z is 480 ohms. I have a lot more current now. I have um, 20.83 repeating milliamps. 
So the current has gone up by a factor of what? 80 or so. So it's a much higher current. And now with that current, I'm going to have power per resistor is equal to I squared R, so 20.83 repeating milliamps squared times 480 ohms is equal to 200 um, All right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Is equal to two hundred and eight point three repeating milli volt amperes. Now, just to make sure this that we have this right, that's ten over. 480 squared, 100 over 480 squared, times 480. Yeah. So my power through, or the parent power is going to be 208.3 millivolt amperes. So now let's note this apparent power is much, much higher for the same um, voltage, the same resistor, the same inductor the same capacitor, but a different frequency. What about the power through the resistor? Well, the power through the resistor is the same because, well, I, I maybe I shouldn't be so cavalier. Uh, I'll, the, the way I should have done this, this is actually power for the resistors is the way I did this. The power parent, I should have just said, is equal to V I is equal to 10 volts times 20.83 repeating milliamps. And power for the resistor, that was actually milliwatts for the unit because it's real. Now we have the power for the capacitor going to be I squared times X um, capacitor so for the capacitor that reactance was 5976 and that gives 2593.8 millivolts AR. For the inductor, it was the same current and the same impedance, so it's got to be the same value. So let's go fill those in on the table. So the power for the capacitor is 2593.8 millivolts AR. R two five nine three point eight millivar. What's the actual power used at resonance? The actual power is going to be the apparent power, two zero eight point three repeating milliwatts. And what is the power factor angle? Well, this was straight horizontal, so it's zero. Now, keep in mind what I said here. You are going to, in this case, be paying for. A lot higher power because you're actually using a lot more power when you're at resonance but you're also only paying for what you're using when in the first case at 1050 Hertz the power you actually getting was virtually zero but you were still paying for a fair amount even though you weren't getting it so that's well pretty much what we did in lab just doing it a second time finally a transformer problem a transformer has two windings. So here's how we usually draw a transformer. We draw a core like this. If that's an iron core, you're going to have the magnetic field is very strong throughout. And then we have, here's winding number one. 
and here is winding number two. And we're going to have current one going in, current two coming out, and voltage one across here. Doesn't really matter what side I put there. Voltage two here. So there's the figure of what we have for it. And remember, for an ideal transform, which is all you need to know, V1 over V2 equals N1 over N2 equals I2 over I1. So we have two questions here that actually are very simple. What is N2 given V1 and V2 um, and N1? So I'm just going to solve this for N2. So solving this equation right now. So that's going to be N1 was 955 turns. V2 is 120 volts. V1 is 240 volts. Notice that's just going to cut in half. So that's 475, is it? Um, 477.5, excuse me. Now, is it possible to have a half integer number of turns? Actually, it is. You can not do a complete wrap. So it actually is theoretically possible, although we usually just round it to one. I'm going to put 477.5 and not worry about it. Now it asks about the power. Now I can use this equation in the blue box. But remember, that equation came from the idealized power 1 equals power 2, or I1 V1 is equal to I2 V2. So the quickest way to get this current is solving that. So I1 is equal to I2 V2 over V1 equals 15 amps times, and since we just did V2 over V1 is 120 over 240 is 1 half. I'm just going to put 1 half there. So 15 amps times 1 half, half of 15 is 7 and a half. And we're done. Once again, I hope that helps you be more prepared for the exam. Have a great evening.